Welcome to Crimes of Our Times Live. I'm filmmaker and author John Borowski, and you have seen my works on screen such as H.H. H. Holmes, America's First Serial Killer, and Serial Killer Culture, and books such as The Ed Gein File and John Wayne Gacy, Hunting a Predator. Today, my co-host is author Harold Schechter. I would say he's kind of like the godfather of our modern true crime books. He's covered serial killers and criminals in dozens of nonfiction and fiction books. And we go way back. We um, worked on H.H. H. Holmes, America's first serial killer initially. Welcome, Harold. How are you? I'm good. Very good. Um, tested positive for COVID, but otherwise fine. Wow. Yeah. I mean, when you had told me that, I was really worried because we can't have one of our preeminent true crime uh, writers gone from this earth. We need you. Yeah, well, thank you. Very kind of you. Um, yes. No, I'm glad I'm still here. That's awesome. Well, and, you know, again, I mean, did you, I mean, did it, was it, when you had it, was it really bad or did you feel much or? You know, it was like having the flu, uh, you know, pretty much. Uh, knocked off my feet for a couple of weeks, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously one of the lucky ones uh, compared to the you know, other people at my advanced age have had it, so. Yeah, all right, and you know, so I wanna, are you still uh, working with, I mean, you know, I, you're probably off now, but you still a professor with Queens College, could you, you know, talk to, you know, uh, people about that? Well, actually, I am now Professor Emeritus, um, which uh, sounds pretty distinguished. Uh, I retired uh, about two years ago uh, after teaching at Queens College for 42 years. Uh, I was actually a, uh, a professor of American literature. Um, so mostly I taught 19th century American literature, uh, Poe and Hawthorne and Melville. Um, I also did a course called Myth and Archetype, uh, which was sort of based on, well, myth criticism, you know, the notion that uh, there are these universal story patterns that uh, appear in the cultures of all times and all places. So, um, But also I had a second career, as you pointed out, as a writer of mostly historical true crime, uh, which began, gosh, probably back around 1989 now with my book on Ed Gein. So now that I'm retired, when I'm not um, like PlayStation 4, um, you know, I'm still doing writing. I have a couple of books coming out. You have to um, send me your PlayStation 4 name so we could, so I know when you're on, because I play it too, so well, yeah, you know, that'd be I fun. Do it. I don't really do it on the internet with other people. You know, I'm not. No, I don't either. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, but it's nice to see when you're on, you know. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I can't say, again, I, you know, at my age, um, even though I play a lot, uh, you know, I don't have the skills of your younger gamers. You know, when my son, sons-in-law come over, you know, it's taken me months to get through Call of Duty World War II. You know, they got through it in like a few hours, so. Yeah, right. But, you know, what's interesting, some of these younger kids, you throw those old school games at them and they can't, they're, those are tough because, you know, we remember those. I mean, you know, and when we go back to those now, it's like, wow, you had to jump that far and it took you an hour. You know? Well, I remember Pong, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah, I had Atari when I was a kid. Well, and, you know, let's talk about, you know, some of your books and the serial killers. You know, um, I think Gein was your first one. The, the book called Deviant, and that was around 89. You had you had written some other books before that, but was was that your first serial killer concentrated book? Yeah, it was my first true crime book. Um, uh, as you say, I mean, I'd been writing books up to that point, you know, some scholarly books, academic books, which you have to do if you want to get tenure and be promoted and so on. Um, but And I did a couple of college textbooks, um, but I did some other books, and in fact, the book... Uh, that I did right before the Gein book um, was a book about movie special effects, book right. film tricks. This is right before CGI came in. Uh, it was while researching that book, you know, I went to Pittsburgh and I interviewed Tom Savini and people like that. And um, uh, it was while researching that that I discovered that uh, Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 
Silence of the Lambs hadn't come out yet, were both inspired by this real life crime. So I um, became very fascinated by that, pitched the idea to my editor, uh, and yeah, that became my first true crime book. Interestingly, the phrase serial killer appears nowhere in the book because it was a little before the whole serial killer thing started. Um, well, I mean, it started. I mean, uh, my research uh, indicates that the first use of the term uh, in modern times in America was around 1982. Uh, I mean, it had been coined way back in the 1930s, but it wasn't until the um, Atlanta child murders uh, that the New York Times published an article which used the phrase serial killer. So my book was a little after that. I never really considered Ed Gein a serial killer per se. Well, right. And, you know, because that's the thing, you know, when in the past we talked about Ed Gein, you know, he murdered two that we could say for sure, correct? But then they changed the, didn't the FBI change the definition of serial killer to be two or more murders? So now he is classified as. I guess so. But I mean, it's weird. <laughs> I mean, I was, you know, once I start, when I started really getting into the whole serial killer thing, you know, the, the people who clearly um, fell into that category at the time it became this nationwide phenomenon uh, were Gacy, you know, Bundy, um, Dahmer, the Hillside Stranglers. You know, those were the kind of people who were used to be called lust murderers. Um, you know, they were extreme sexual sadists who got their sick pleasure from uh, torturing and murdering victims over a span of time, you know, with cool right. and, You know, Gein that didn't really fit into that category. You know, Gein did kill a couple of women, uh, but he executed them swiftly. He was basically just interested in getting their corpses to do things to. I mean, Gein was essentially a necrophile rather than a serial murder in the sense that uh, Gacy was or, or Bundy was, um, you know, which is why even though in terms of, you know, numerically, you know, he might fall into that FBI category, I never really considered him to be a serial killer. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. And, you know, it was very interesting. I, I believe I had read one of your interviews where you had talked about Gein, you know, because he had made chairs out of skin and lampshades out of skin and kept heads. You had mentioned something like you'd compare them to like some tribes or something, you know, that would collect stuff like that. Talk about that. Yeah, well, that's actually interesting to me. Um, you know, there's I, I think part of the fascination with Gein, we're just talking to somebody about this is that there's all this archaic, primitive, ritual, religious stuff that seemed to have erupted uh, in his psyche. Um, but, you know, I mean, the thing, for example, with skinning, you know, somebody, flaying somebody and putting on their skin, you know, you find that, for example, an Aztec, among Aztec priests would do that. Uh, obviously, you know, keeping, well, what's some people who saw them thought were, what he himself claimed were shrunken heads, you know, keeping human body parts as trophies and so on and so forth. You know, that's a kind of practice you do find in these very, very primitive cultures. So, um, yeah, there's some weird way in which, you know, in, in the midst of this uh, 1950s Eisenhower era post-World War II culture, which was all about you know, consumerism and suburban living and, you know, in the, in the middle of the American heartland, there was this guy who, you know, in his own remote ramshackle house was kind of enacting all these pagan rituals. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably what you're referring to. Yeah, I, I found that fascinating, you know, because we try and study these serial killers from psychological perspectives. And, you know, you're friends with Joe Coleman, and he's been in several of my films. I always say that Joe Coleman is like the philosopher of the serial killer world because he has these theories which 
you know, the common person, like when you take Albert Fish, you know, he has these theories about what's going on with Fish and why he's thinking that way. Whereas, you know, when somebody might watch his interview, they would immediately say, ah, he's nuts. But he just looks at it from a different angle than all of us do. Yeah, actually spoke to Joe early this evening. He sends his regards. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, Joe is very plugged into that kind of world himself. I mean, his paintings uh, are full of, you know, all of this uh, mythic imagery and stuff. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then, so you followed up Gein with Albert Fish. And when you have, did research for your Gein book, did you talk to Robert Block? Because you had mentioned something that Gein meant, uh, that Block said to you, which I, I always love that quote. So talk about that. Well, we corresponded, actually. I was just looking recently at the letters we exchanged. Um, but yeah, at one point, one of the questions I asked him was why he thought people were so fascinated by Ed Gein. And he wrote back and said, it's because they've forgotten about Albert Fish. So uh, that led me to start investigating the Fish case. And that became, Fish became the subject of my second book, uh, Deranged. Um, you know, and that was, that was actually, the, you know, people are always asking me if I get disturbed with, you know, right. these books. And, you know, that was the book I was most, had most trouble writing, um, partly because I had two young daughters at the time, or I should say my daughters were very young at the time. Um, I mean, my younger daughter was about Grace Bud's age, you know, when she was abducted. Uh, and, you know, Fish was so over the top nightmarish um, that that book was difficult for me, partly because, you know, when I write these books, in, in order to really, you know, I have to try to understand the people I'm writing about. And, uh, you know, that's sometimes more in the past than nowadays, but, you know, necessitated my going into some very dark places in my own psyche so I could somehow understand what was going on in the mind of somebody like Fish. So, yeah, that was a, a hard book to write. Yeah, did living in New York, you know, state help at all with the fish research? I know, you know, Coleman has the original letter that fish wrote to Bud, but I didn't know if, you know, that because, you know, of course, me being in Chicago now researching for my Gacy film, it's, it's kind of makes it easier because I'm here. Did you find that with Albert Fish? Absolutely. In fact, I, I couldn't have written the book had it not been for this one thing, which was, I knew Fish had been uh, represented at his trial um, by this uh, lawyer named James Dempsey, uh, who lived uh, up in, I guess, uh, Poughkeepsie, um, which was not too far north from where I was living at the time in Westchester County. So I got the Poughkeepsie phone book. Uh, it was either Poughkeepsie or Peekskill, but I think it was Poughkeepsie. Anyway, I got the Poughkeepsie phone book and looked up and, and I saw there was a James Dempsey, and I, I assumed it was his son, you know, because this we're talking about 1980-something, and Fisher's trial took place in 1934. Okay. It's like 60 years later, 50 years later. Anyway, I, I called, somebody picked up, and it turned out to be the James Dempsey, who was like 90 years old, but still going to his office every day. So I went up to interview him and I saw he had one trial transcript which was thousands of pages and had all of this um, evidence in it and all these letters that Fish had written you know everybody's familiar with the uh, letter he wrote to Grace Bud's mother but you know he was an obsessive sender of obscene letters and they had all the letters anyway I realized I, I couldn't write my book without that. Um, so I asked Dempsey if I could, you know, borrow it in Xerox. He said, absolutely not. Um, he said, you know, I, I had two copies and I once lent someone, lent it to someone and they never returned it. No. I said, look, I, I'm just going to take it for a few hours and go to this local Xerox store and I'll bring it right back. No, you can't do that. I, I literally, I said, look out the window. That's my car. Here are the keys to my car. If I don't come back with it, you can keep the car. 
He said, no. So finally, um, I, you know, I, I, I can't remember if I begged or whatever, but, but finally he agreed to let me do it, but only in the company of the caretaker of his property, who I agreed to pay, you know, by the hour. Um, anyway, so he finally let me do it. You know, I went to the nearest coffee shop made a copy of this and, and I realized, you know, I, I had virtually everything I needed to write the book. I mean, I still had to do a lot of research in newspapers and so on. Uh, but in answer to your quite short answer, yeah, if I hadn't been living in New York, um, I don't know that I ever would have had that meeting with Dempsey and gotten hold of that transcript. Yeah, that's a great story. You know, I mean, you know, those happy accidents, right? You know, these things do happen and, you know, for researchers like us, we're enamored when those things happen to us. Um, and then let's, there was, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, the happy accent there was that the guy who defended Albert Fitch was still alive and practicing law at 90 years old. So. And do you remember how many pages total that you copied? Was it that hundreds, thousands? It had to be thousands. Probably. I'm thinking uh, 1,600 maybe. Wow. That's I mean, insane. Yeah, all afternoon. Right. Yeah, that really is insane. And that brings us to the book where I was first introduced to your work, Depraved, which is on H.H. H. Holmes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you say, with, with your books, you know, and I'm not sure what your process is like, and I'd like to hear about that after this. But, you know, I you inspired me with my documentary films on serial killers because what it seems to me that you do is like, you know, and I learned from you in that respect, you put them under a microscope mm -hmm. and you, you focus on everything about their life, you know, and you don't leave anything out, you know, and that's kind of what I do. And that's when I was introduced to your work on H.H. H. Holmes. Talk about that book because, you know, like your other books, you know, the Gein book and the Fish book, there weren't many books out on Holmes. There were probably maybe two, Torture Doctor and the Holmes Spitzel case maybe. And then yours was like, right. you know, the it, in my, it's still, your book is the Holmes book. So talk about that. Um, yeah, I can't remember, you know, when I when I first started writing these books, um, the Gein book, the Fish book, I immodestly thought that I was creating a new literary genre because I didn't think of them as true crime. I thought of them as true horror. Mm -hmm. And that I was going to write about subjects um, who, you know, had, had taken on in the popular imagination, you know, this kind of uh, uh, boogeyman quality. And, you know, they were always compared to supernatural figures, cannibals and vampires and, you know, bluebeards and so on. And so Werewolf, on. yeah. Werewolf. Um, to some, you know, uh, there was a Robert Block connection with uh, Holmes because Block wrote, I think it was called, I can't remember the name of it now, but Block wrote a novel um, based on Holmes. American Gothic, I think. American Gothic, yeah. yeah. And there was another novel that was written by a Pulitzer Prize winner called The Scarlet Mansion. Um, yeah. Based on Holmes. Um, anyway, uh, how, how exactly, I, I can't actually remember how I hit on Holmes to be the subject of what I consider to be my D trilogy, Deviant, Deranged, and Depraved. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, once I did, um, yeah, I mean, I, I started investigating. It was a fascinating, fascinating story. Again, it involved a lot of research. I remember uh, I spent time at the Library of Congress uh, where they had a copy of uh, Holmes' Confession. Um, you know, went to Chicago, you know, I do a lot in terms of my process, you know, before I even start writing the book, I assemble thousands of pages of research material. A lot of it, you know, back then, you know, now you can do a lot of newspaper research on the internet, obviously, you know, back then I would have to go to libraries uh, and make Xeroxes of microfilms of old newspapers you know, some of which uh, were available in the New York Public Library, but not all. So again, some I had to go to the Library of Congress for, some I had to go to Chicago for. Um, I was in, I actually corresponded, and 
at my age, I can't remember a lot of things. And, and I don't remember the name of the guy who wrote The Scarlet Mansion, but he was very, very helpful to me. Uh, and he loaned me some of his, his research material. And he also put me in touch um, with uh, the granddaughter um, of, I, I guess she was the granddaughter of uh, Peitzel's I was told, I I swear, wife. Her name was Mildred Voorhees. We actually became quite friendly. My book, I think, is, as I remember, is dedicated to her. Um, and she supplied me with all this incredible material having to do with, uh, you know, Peitzel and his family. In fact, um, original photographs of the children that Holmes murdered and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, you know, I assemble thousands of pages of uh, primary source material. You know, I read whatever secondary source material is available. Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as you know, my process in a certain sense is not that different from yours as a filmmaker. You know, it's a matter of assembling the material into a compelling narrative. You know, I have to decide, um, uh, you know, how I'm going to tell the story in such a way uh, as to make it, you know, suspenseful and, you know, kind of a page turner and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, you know, very pleased with the Holmes book. Um, as you say, I still think it's the most definitive account of that story. I agree. And, you know, though, as time goes on, like you're saying, that was in um, and you know, so we're talking about you know what over, you know, well, yeah, it's been a while, so you know, 10, 15 years. But you know, when we're talking about H. H. Holmes and some of these true crime stories, yeah. over time, do you think anything happens to these stories over time? Because now. I've been seeing new books out on H.H. H. Holmes, and it seems like with some of these cases, they either go to the extreme or not. So they either want to say they were the most gory and ghoulish of the worst, or nah, they weren't really as bad as people made them out to be. So now I'm seeing a lot of things about Holmes saying, ah, he never rented rooms there. He never did that. He never did this. But it's like, you know, yeah, wait. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I have, you know, on shows and made that claim myself. And there is a book written by some Chicago guy, maybe you're aware of his name, who has debunked some of the myths. I, I have to say uh, that I do think, uh, you know, I have come to the conclusion that a lot of those, uh, a lot of those stories about all the people he killed in his, uh, you know, hotel and so on and so forth were, you know, were fabricated by the yellow. The of course. I mean, he obviously was a serial killer. And there's no doubt that he killed Peitzel and the, you know, the kids and, you know, a couple of the women he was involved with, although those possibly were botched abortions, who knows. Um, but all this stuff about the World's Fair Hotel, um, you, you know, I've come to believe that uh, there, that, you know, it was just like made up to sell newspapers at the height of this uh, yellow journalism stuff. Right. Yeah, you know, it, go ahead. You, know, uh, you might know, um, I've read his book, and, you know, it's, it's a very good book. The guy who recently published a book about Holmes, I think his first name is David. Anyway, I don't know, but... but uh, Adam Seltzer? So, yeah, is it Seltzer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that book, mm -hmm. you know, I, I looked at, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think he did a very good job of uh, correcting uh, some of the, um, you know, some of the myths. That you know, I myself, right. you know, was to some extent guilty of uh, perpetuating. Um, so, well, but you know, it, it's like when I talk to people about my process, much like yours, I tell them I usually save the newspapers for the last because you know, isn't it true that the further back you go, the newspapers are almost like the Enquirer? They would make things up on the spot, yeah, right? They did. They would make up stuff. You have to be very, very careful about. Um, you know, about uh, relying on them, you know, for factual stuff. I mean, I was always checking and double checking against things. Um, on the other hand, they often do contain very valuable information. Plus, 
you know, the language of them is often so fascinating, um, you know, that it's hard to resist quoting them every now and then. But yeah, I mean, you know, the yellow press in the 1890s and the tabloids in the 1920s, you know, those people were totally shameless about uh, inventing things. So you really do have to be very, very careful. Yeah, and that's what I'm finding out researching the Gacy case, because when I interviewed uh, William Kunkel, the prosecutor, uh, somehow he didn't get my email for the questions. And when he came to the interview, I gave him my questions and he's looking out, where'd you hear this? This isn't true. Where did you hear this? I said, I got all this information from the books that the attorneys and everyone else wrote. He said, and then the same thing when I interviewed Jason Moran, who is on the current you know, case of the Gacy Unidentifieds, there's still six Unidentifieds. And he said, there's always a difference between what newspapers report and the truth in the case, you know, and, and the evidence. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. and that's what I'm... Um, yeah. No, I mean, uh, one difference between the, the books that I've written over the last 10 years or so, um, and those earlier books is, uh, you know, now um, I, I don't include anything that I can't document. And uh, those other, you know, those other books had no footnotes. I mean, it would have, particularly at the end of the Holmes book, for example, you know, a long thing at the end talking about all my source material. Um, but, you know, all my books, uh, I don't know, for the last 10, 15 years have been heavily footnoted. So. Right. Well, I found it, you know, an interesting, and this is, I think, a testament to you, you know, when, you know, I mean, a lot of, well, I think almost everything of H.H. H. Holmes in the Double White City was credited to you or the newspaper, you know, right. and, you know, and that brings us to Fiend, your book on Jesse Pomeroy, who's this lesser known, yeah. you know, child, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a young teenager, you know, young boy who murdered other, you know, kids. Um, you know, and so talk about that. What was that like? Because, you know, again, you know, yours was kind of like the first, I, was it the first ever on Power? I think so. Yeah. And I can't really remember how I discovered Palmer. You know, usually what happens is, you know, I'm researching one case, uh, and in the course of researching that, I might come across a reference, you know, to some other case. Um, that interests me, and I'll start looking into that one. Um, but yeah, again, the Pomeroy case, uh, uh, you know, I, I went to Boston. You know, he was known as the Boston Boy Fiend. As you say, uh, he was a 13 year old, um, really, sex murderer uh, who had uh, been put in reform school. This was right after the Civil War in Bo South Boston. Um, and he had. Uh, attacked some children to put into reform school. He was let out early. He immediately uh, killed and sexually mutilated a couple of young children. He was sentenced to hang. I think at the time he was only 14 years old. There was a great outcry about giving the death sentence to somebody that young. So he was put in solitary confinement, I think for the longest stretch or maybe the second longest stretch in solitary confinement, you know, at the time after the Birdman of Alcatraz. Um, but one of the interesting things there was I, I went to Boston to do research in this uh, Kennedy Library where I knew, uh, and again, I can't, don't remember how I found this out, where they had some Jesse Pomeroy material. And uh, I still remember the librarian took me into the stacks where they kept these old boxes uh, and we brought it out. Nobody had looked at it, you know, for like a hundred years. And inside I found actual original letters, handwritten letters uh, that Jesse Pomeroy had written uh, when he was in prison. So the other thing I, I found, I don't know if you've ever found this, um, it's often been the case when I started books and the Jesse Pomeroy book was a, an example of this, in doing my research, you know, like I'll call around, let's say I'll call a librarian or I'll call a courthouse and somebody will say, oh, you know, somebody else was here like a couple of years ago, you know, doing research on that case. 
and I'll get that person's name and I would contact them. And almost invariably, this would be somebody who was obsessed with this case and who had assembled all this research material with the thought that he might write a book about it, but basically realized he was never going to write a book about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have, through the force of my charming personality, although also by opening up my pocketbook, um, you know, somehow persuaded them to turn over uh, all this research material to me. Um, so, uh, you know, that happened with the Pomeroy case. That happened with the book I wrote about Earl Leonard Nelson, the gorilla man of the 1920s who went around strangling landladies. You know, it's happened a number of times, so. Well, and you know, I, and again, it must be a testament to you as an originator of these cases because there was a, within the last maybe two or three years, there was a book on Pomeroy and it was an almost, we talked about this, it was almost an exact copy of yours with a little bit more information thrown in there. You know? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I, uh, yes, I was aware of that. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, that book was quite a bit to me. You know, I mean, you know, and how do you feel when that happens, though? I mean, you know, do you, I mean, because, I mean, this happens to me, too. You know, people steal my work, they upload it to YouTube, I get upset at first, and I'm like, ah, oh, well, well, maybe it's, you know, flattery. I don't know. What? Well, how do you feel? Well, no. I mean, I have felt ripped off from time to time. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean... You know, I mean, ultimately, there's nothing I could do. I mean, I sent the the person who wrote the uh, uh, Jesse Pomeroy book that you mentioned. I contacted. I just said, "Oh, I just got your Jesse Pomeroy book. I'm going to read it closely with a great deal of interest and stuff like that." You know, mildly threatening note, but um, uh. You know, but it's also tricky, I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, unless it's outright plagiarism, right. you know, and there have been cases in a couple of these books where there might be a few sentences or more that clearly were taken from my book. But I mean, unless it's outright plagiarism, you know, it's very hard to make any kind of legal case. Plus, you know, I'm not into like suing people. Um, so uh you know i just i just will feel you know gotten used to feeling ripped off every now and then but you know whatever i mean i take pride in having um i don't know how to describe myself but, but been a little ahead of the curve right in terms of true crime because right. when i started when I started writing true crime, it was such a, regardless, such a disreputable genre. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even get, you know, I tried to persuade uh, my publisher at that time, Simon Schuster, to publish the Ed Gein book in hardcover. And it was like, first of all, back then, the received wisdom in publishing was that people weren't interested in historical crime. You know, they're just interested, you know, like in cold blood or whatever, mm -hmm. you know crimes um and that you know true crime is the kind of thing you published in paperback you know and sold on the book racks and greyhound bus stations and stuff so um uh you know now as you know i mean it's become you know this incredibly this phenomenon uh cultural phenomenon so you know i feel good about that i mean i feel good about again having uh uh you know, contributed, um, right. you know, to the, you know, to the uh, growing stature of this genre. Yeah, you know, and like I said, you know, even when you influence people, and we all influence each other, so, you know, there was something in your book, uh, you know, Depraved, that mm -hmm. talked about the rooms being lined with asbestos and the gas going into the rooms. I use that in my film, and then that exact line, for American Horror Story, the TV show, they they stole that exact line from my film and put it on their show where they had the Holmes episode or whatever, you know, the, yeah. so again, I mean, it happens to all of us, you know, but I, I do think, you know, again, maybe it, I think flattery or, you know, 
again, you're the kind of originator of these things. And we're going to get to that too, you know, because it's kind of interesting now. Why do you think, what kind of tipped serial killers into this whole kind of cool pop culture thing now? You know, because 20, 30 years ago, you know, you wore a shirt with John Gacy on it. Forget it now. You could wear a Manson shirt. I had a Manson shirt on the other day that just said family and it had his eyes. I was in Target. And the guy said, cool shirt. So <laughs> what do you think? Was it Mind Hunter? What slowly, and it may have been your help too, part of the serial killer culture that kind of tipped it into, okay, this is okay that we could talk about it. Well, I mean, I think the two things, you know, that uh, it seems to me that were very, very uh, important in terms of that were the podcast serial uh, and, you know, that HBO series on Durst. Um, you know, suddenly people became, you know, really kind of obsessed with this. Uh, and that gave it a kind of cultural legitimacy uh, that it hadn't had before. Um, you know, then, uh, of course, uh, Larson's Devil in the White City, which we mentioned before that, you know, made rather extensive use of my book. Um, so there were these different things coming together, I think, um, that suddenly, you know, true crime, you know, is always regarded as this guilty pleasure. Uh, and people were always a little apologetic about being interested in it. Um, you know, what I always said about Devil in the White City, is you know it made it safe for you know suburban book clubs to talk about serial killers or to indulge you know an interest that they would have been too embarrassed to openly admit to um you know so suddenly you know as you know i mean people have always been fascinated by true crime but you know these things suddenly gave it a kind of cultural legitimacy that allowed it to become mainstream uh, and I think that's what's happened. And even Mindhunter, did you watch that? I did not watch Mindhunter. You know, funnily enough, I don't watch a lot of things anymore um, <laughs> with serial killers. Uh, you know, it's been so much part of my life for so long. Um, I have crossed paths with, uh, um, on a number of occasions with- uh, John Douglas. John Douglas. Um, you know, yeah, so, and I have read his books, certainly. Yeah. Um, what was interesting, do you, someone was asking here and I was wondering, have you ever written to any serial killers? I, I have not. I mean, I've been contacted by intermediaries, uh, through intermediaries, uh, by some serial killers. But, you know, I, um, you know, well, I mean, in prison. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, who wanted me to write their books, but, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I had an experience years ago, which convinced me not to have communications with sociopathic personalities. Can you share that? It was just uh, some person who I'd become a pen pal with, really. who was a really interesting person, very, very intelligent. And, um, you know, but but it just became a thing where I felt, uh, he, you know, he kept asking more and more and more of me. And then um, at one point, you know, he was allowed one uh, phone call a month and he would call my house. And one time uh, I was at home, my daughter, who was like nine years old, answered. And we got home and, <laughs> and she said, Daddy, somebody, this guy called. And he was so nice, I want to marry him. Oh, and, wow. I mean, and he was fine. I mean, he was not a serial killer. He was not a murderer. Right. Um, you know, and, and he was, you know, a, a person of a lot of promise, high intelligence. So, you know, I mean, he was not like a scary sociopath. But nevertheless, you know, it just became an intrusion. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so, so anyways, that's why I've, kept, uh, I've gotten, as I said, sometimes correspondence from people in prison uh, who have been not necessarily serial murders, but, you know, people guilty of homicide and so on and so forth, um, generally who have liked my books. But, and and is that, 
And is that because you're, you know, interested in the historical aspect of it? You know, because I'm kind of the same way, you know, Keith Jesperson had sent me a letter, but I had never written serial killers and I really didn't have an interest to. I was interested in the history, their psychology, the time period they lived in, those things. Well, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, as I said, I was an academic for 42 years. Uh, one of the reasons I became got a PhD in American literature um, is because I love doing research. So certainly this allowed me to, you know, indulge that appetite. Um, and I'm interested in the psychology, but, you know, but what has always interested me more is the storytelling aspect of it. You know, why it is we need stories about monsters uh, from a very early age. And again, what interested me initially about Jean, for example, you know, is the way his crimes became mythicized, um, you know, turned into folklore uh, and turned into these movies uh, which reinvented his story in ways that reflected, you know, the, the particular obsessions of the cultural moment. So Psycho, even when it was published in 61, you know, it was very much a product of the 1950s. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre obviously has a great deal to do with the whole Vietnam era. Um, Silence of the Lambs, you know, I think had a lot to do with certain kinds of, uh, you know, bodily obsessions at the time. And then, and then again, um, uh, you know, I was a, a a scholar of myth and archetype. So very interesting to me how these crimes kind of get assimilated to these age old folklore stories or, you know, myths and so on and so forth. So. And songs. And, and that's the thing that they become this part of pop culture and songs and shirts and merchandising and, you know, in that respect, because like you said, they become these, you know, like, when I go to conventions, I have a big stand up of Pogo the Clown. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time people are fine with it. And the organizers usually like that aspect because it draws people. But, you know, it's become Pogo even separate of Gacy in a sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You should see, I just watched a documentary, Wrinkles the Cl Clown. Have you seen I heard that? about, no, I heard about that. Yeah, I recommend it. Really? Wrinkles? I'll look it up. Um, so, and then, you know, do you, is this true? I, through my researches, I believe I discovered that, that, or maybe it's well generally known that females, are they the main demographic for true crime? Yes. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I think that women traditionally have not had the kinds of outlets, you know, for their own violent, sadistic, socially unacceptable impulses that men have. Um, I do think, you know, it's, an, uh, you know, there are two, there are several related phenomena. One is, as I'm sure you know, um, the way in which, you know, every serial killer, no matter how horrendous, immediately attracts groupies right. um, and uh, and also that and this is commented on all the time when I you know when, when I do my research you know whenever there's a trial of you know some serial killer, the majority of the audience members uh, who want to be there and see these proceedings and catch a glimpse of the killer or women um, so you know, I think that, um, you know, there are complicated, you know, psychological reasons for that. Right. One is the one I mentioned. You know, I think uh, I was once, I, I used to say I the only member of the Queens College faculty ever to be on the Jerry Springer show. And uh, I was on years ago, this was before it was just people, you know, overweight trailer type people you know, claiming to have slept with each other's relatives and stuff. But um, I, I, the topic was women who fall in love with serial killers. And I was on with this woman who, like, had fallen in love with uh, Henry Lee Lucas um, and used to visit all the time. Hmm. Um,
and you know that got me you know think about the topic and, and i think often you know certain women have this kind of beauty and the beast fantasy um you know my my love will domesticate this monster um i think it's also a very exaggerated slightly pathological expression of something that seems to be common in women's fantasies of you know falling for the bad boy um, and so on and so forth so yeah i think it's a combination of those things and there's a a term i i thought like hysterophobia or something like that where the where females like for instance i'm a member of a facebook group wow. and all the group is dedicated to females love of jeffrey dahmer and these women go on there they post pictures with him hearts i love you jeff even yeah. though he's dead and he was gay but they they're obsessed with him and and that term i forget exactly how to pronounce it but they said that a lot of women may feel comfortable with the fact that they know where these men are and no one's going to cheat on them they're inside a prison you know so maybe you know, who knows i would imagine philia as opposed to phobia um, philia that's it um, but uh, yeah you know it's a very very yeah i mean uh i mean i've heard amazing stories about you know, women, you know, like uh, Edmund Kemper having these girlfriends when they, once they get into prison and, you know, well, you know, like um, the Night Stalker. I mean, these guys get married and Manson got married to like a 20 year old woman when he was in his 80s or something. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. it's big, you know, and it's, but so you don't write criminals or serial killers, but do you, you collect some artifacts because you have some of Pomeroy's letters you've got? Do you have anything else? Of yeah, I, I don't really mention? collect artifacts. I mean, I've, you know... Stumbled across. <laughs> had a few. But no, I'm not a murderabilia person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, usually when I write a book, I like to have some artifact connected with the crime in my study just to... Um, you know, as a kind of a totemic object, you know, for inspiration. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that I have, I mean, so, you know, every now and then some friend might give me, like Joe, you know, might give me some weird serial killer related object yeah. or something. But, but I'm not you, oh yeah, I didn't think you were, I know you had some pieces, but you know, talk about your latest book. Well, uh, I have two latest books. I have a book coming out in July. Yes. So this is a book about, um, well, it's called Rip from the Headlines, The Shocking Truth Stories Behind Movies' Most Memorable Crimes. So it's a book about uh, movies, uh, mostly Hollywood movies, but some foreign movies, um, which are fictional. Um, but were inspired by real crimes. You know, I say in the introduction, you know, nowadays, very hard to go to a movie and not see an opening thing that says based on true events, you know. Um, they didn't do that so much in the past, but screenwriters did turn to the newspapers and so on to get inspiration. So this is a, a book that uh, talks about the movies and then talks about the crimes that inspired them. So some are very well known, like Psycho, um, or Alfred Hitchcock's rope, uh, but others um, people don't realize were based on real crimes, like Alfred Hitchcock's frenzy, or uh, even something like Scream, uh, wh you know, where the screenwriter Kevin Williamson, you know, talked about how, you know, he was uh, uh, moved to write it after seeing some programs about Danny Rawlings, the Gainesville Ripper. Um, so that's, you know, that's that book. The other book I have, which will come out about a year from now, uh, is a book about, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, most people haven't, interestingly, called The Bath School Massacre, or The Bath School Disaster, um, which is the worst school massacre in U.S. history. <laughs> Excuse me. I haven't heard of that one. That one sounds interesting. When was that? That was in the spring of 1927, May 1927. Um, it was the worst act of domestic terrorism 
before Timothy McVeigh blew up that uh, building in Oklahoma City. Took place in a little town in Michigan, about an hour from Lansing, called Bath. Um, and one of the really respected members of the community, who was actually on the school board, a guy named Andrew Kehoe, um, uh, developed this insane grudge against the town for various reasons, uh, and uh, rigged the basement of their consolidated school. It was this little town, uh, you know, a farming community that had all these little one-room schoolhouses, and they decided to build this modern consolidated school, which taught classes from kindergarten up through high school. You know, and it was the pride of the community and uh, really one of the most uh, modern schools in Michigan at that time. Sky Kehoe uh, spent weeks at night sneaking in and rigging the basement with um, dynamite. And uh, on the last day of school, uh, he, you know, he set off a timer and he intended to blow the entire school up. And if he did, he would have essentially killed every child in the community. Um, but fortunately, part of it didn't detonate, but a whole wing of the school did. And he ended up killing from like 38 children and uh, about half a dozen school teachers. And then while all the first responders had gathered at the scene and were frantically trying to save, you know, dig out the kids, he loaded his Ford pickup truck with shrapnel and more dynamite, drove it down to the school and blew himself and a bunch of other people up. So he was like also a suicide car bomber. So this wow. happened in May, 1927. It was, but the, one of the reasons nobody's ever heard of it, well, some people have, but most people haven't, is it was on the front page of every newspaper in America, including the New York Times. But two days later, Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic which was, of course, you know, this epical event. And it immediately displaced the bath story from the newspapers. Um, and it completely faded into obscurity. So, um, so I have a book on that subject coming out, uh, I guess, next April. Oh, that's awesome. Congrats on that. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever heard of that. But, you know, that's the thing, you know, in America and maybe other countries, you know, it, we don't look back, you know, beyond five or 10 years. It's like, wow, these mass murderers and serial killers, you know, talk about they've always been around, you know. True. But I mean, one of the things that interested me, and I wrote a book about this called Psycho USA. Yes. Um, and, you know, is, is why, uh, you know, certain killers and certain crimes, um, you know, become sort of an, an undying part of our cultural mythology. Leopold and Loeb, let's say, or Lizzie mm -hmm. Borden. You know, Leopold and Loeb is a good example. You know, I mean, as these things go, it, it wasn't like the most horrific crime ever committed. I mean, it was a terrible thing. They abducted this, you know, teenage boy and killed him and so on and so forth. But, you know, you can turn to the Chicago newspapers on almost any day in the 1920s, you know, and come across equally or more horrific murders that were committed. You know, so why has that one become, you know, so immortalized in our culture? Uh, so I'm very interested in, in that subject. Again, why certain crimes, um, you know, can be very sensational at the time and then, and then forgotten. Another uh, recent short thing I published um, uh, on Kindle, uh, something called The Ragged Stranger, another good example. Uh, this guy named Carl Wanderer, who is a World War I army vet, um, uh, arranged, you know, he, he cooked up this scheme to get his uh, pregnant wife murdered. He, uh, he hired a homeless guy to follow him and his wife home from the movies one night and pretend to rob them. He, he didn't tell the guy why. He just said, you know, I'll give you like, five bucks, just follow us home, you know, walk into the building with us, say this is a robbery, we'll hand over the money and that's it. Anyway, as soon as the guy did, Wanderer 
pulled out these guns and started shooting and killed his wife and killed this guy and then claimed that, um, you know, the, the, the ragged stranger as he came to be known because he was never identified, this homeless guy, you know, had pulled out a gun and started shooting and he, Wanderer, you know, had pulled out his army revolver that he always carried or his cult actually and, uh, and shot this guy dead. And he was hailed as a hero. And then it became clear that, you know, he had killed his wife, he'd killed this guy. But this was a case, uh, this was around 1920, you, you know, that was a headline story in Chicago for months. And it was covered all over the country. You know, this guy who was proclaimed as a hero for saving his wife and then turns out to be this killer. Again, totally forgotten. So, so, you know, that, as with the Bath School disaster, one of the things that attracted me to it was how and why a crime of that magnitude, you know, even now with all the school shootings, the worst school massacre in U.S. history has been relegated to such obscurity. Right. right. And why do you, I mean, why do you think that is? Is it because of maybe some deal, you know, they, the details are salacious or, I mean, we don't even know, right? It's just whatever the media picks up on. Well, I mean, usually the more salacious, the better. Right. But no, I mean, I think to some extent, I think it was a crime that was ahead of its time. You know, uh, obviously if some guy, God forbid, you know, blew up a public school now, you can imagine, you know, the 24 seven news coverage. You know, back then it was such a weird anomaly. Well, part of it was, again, that it happened when Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic. But part of it was, it just seemed like such a, it didn't resonate at all with the culture. Um, you know, the Leopold and Loeb case did. Leopold and Loeb case, in the way Manson, you know, seemed like the realization of every middle American's worst nightmares about hippie culture. You know, Leopold and Loeb seemed like the nightmarish, realization of you know middle americans fears about what they used to call flaming youth of the 1920s mm -hmm. whereas the school massacre it was just this weird thing you know nobody was obsessed with school massacres back then right. uh so it just didn't catch on and i wonder if you know even back then because like you said they weren't obsessed with the school shooting or you know Holmes as this major serial killer, you know, wasn't even, you know, they called him a multi-murderer at the time period. But, you know, I, I, you know, it's very interesting. And you even mentioned that in the Pomeroy book, you know, I think there was one point we had mentioned there were other children, you know, murdering other children or committing atrocious or more atrocious acts than Pomeroy, but they weren't covered as much as his story was. Very strange. Well, and also partly, although it's not true of the Wander case, but I mean, something like the Bath School Massacre, you know, partly it happened, you know, outside of all the major media centers, you know, right. that can sometimes have an effect. So. Yeah, that's true. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. We got about a minute and a half. So um, you're, talk about your, your newest book and when it's out again and when people can look forward to that. Uh, well, we're from the headline. Yes. Uh, out in July, obviously available for pre-order on Amazon. Um, nicely illustrated, very proud of that book. Uh, the other book, which is called Maniac, um, I think the subtitle is The Bath School Disaster and the Birth of a Modern Mass Murderer. Uh, but that won't be out until, uh, I've just seen some uh, possible covers for it, but that won't be out, I think, until April 2021 assuming we are all still here by then <laughs> right that's what we hope because you know a lot of my uh the conventions i go to have been canceled or postponed but again you know we'll get through this and i look at this as just you know time to uh you know get work done like you are but thank you for your contribution to true crime and your writing and for being on the show and um yeah, I can't thank you enough, you know, and, and I know there were a lot of people that wanted to tune in tonight that tuned in to hear you speak. And it's always a pleasure, Harold, and hopefully we'll work together in the future again. And, uh, you know, we have you in the Jesse Pomeroy film coming out. So we have a lot to look forward to. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you, Harold.